All right, we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, if you're getting food, just you know, continue to do that, but if you can do it quietly, we are actually live streaming this. So um, I am excited today that we have Nathaniel Stinnett here. Nathaniel has over a decade of experience as a senior advisor, consultant, and trainer for political campaigns and issue advocacy nonprofits. He was recently dubbed the voting guru by Grist. Um, and Stinnett was named one of the 50 environmental visionaries that you'll be talking about in 2016. He's held a variety of senior leadership and campaign management positions on the US Senate, congressional, state, and mayoral campaigns, and is a frequent expert speaker on political strategy. He's formerly an attorney um, at the international law firm of DLA Piper, and is also widely recognized for his work as a land use, environmental, and real estate attorney. He holds a BA from Yale and a JD from Boston College and lives in Boston with his wife and now two daughters. We are delighted to have Nathaniel here. Quick announcements before though. Um, for those of you who do not know me, I am Jennifer McFadden, Associate Director of Entrepreneurial Programs. You are in my class, Founders Practicum. So there are students, if you guys wanna raise your hands, who are <coughs> SOM joint degree students who are working on ventures for credit, one of whom, Ariel Hoodies, is doing a podcast this Friday at 3.45 for, at the end of our podcasting conference. Um, she does this incredible podcast about women and stories. And she is interviewing uh, Lila Day, who is a podcaster who runs our podcast called The Stoop. So you can find her podcast at arielhudes.com, H-U-D-E-S. Um, but please do come check it out, and she's awesome. So with that, I will hand over the floor. Awesome, thank you. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. I'm sorry, I have a frog in my throat from, uh, from some allergies this morning, but I'm really excited to be here. I'm gonna chat for about 25 minutes going over uh, the story of how we founded the Environmental Voter Project, why we founded the Environmental Voter Project, and sort of what the whole startup process was. And then hopefully we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers and a nice discussion afterwards. So, the Environmental Voter Project is a nonpartisan nonprofit that uses data analytics to identify environmentalists who aren't voting, and then we apply the latest behavioral science to turn them into more consistent voters. So, unlike most environmental nonprofits, we do not lobby for particular policies. We do not endorse particular candidates. We don't even try to persuade people to care more about the environment. All we're trying to do is find people who are already persuaded, already with us, but aren't voting, and we try to change their habits. We are in the habit-changing business, not the mind-changing business. So, uh, a little bit of the story of how and why we founded this organization. Uh, as Jen had mentioned, I've worked on campaigns for over a decade, big and small, and there is one thing that always frustrated me, and it's something that many of you might already be aware of, and that is this. When you poll likely voters for any election, any election, it could be a city council race here in New Haven, or president of the United States, or governor of California. If you poll likely voters for any election and ask them to prioritize the issues they care about most, climate change and other environmental issues are always way, way down the list of priorities. And that has an enormous impact on how policy is made. Not only does it obviously impact the type of leaders we elect, but no matter whom we elect, even when we elect the world's great environmental champions, it is hard to expect them to spend their political capital on something that voters don't care about. Would any of you try to create a product that there was no marketplace for? No. And when there is no demand in the electoral marketplace for environmental leadership, we don't get it. And I'll give you an example. Back in uh, 2016, right before the presidential election, 
we polled likely voters. Oh, there we go. People who were likely to vote in the upcoming presidential election. We asked them what their number one most important priority was and what their number two most important priority was. Only 2%, only 2% listed climate change or some other environmental issue as their number one priority and another 2% listed it as their number two priority. And I guarantee you there is nothing unique or cherry picked about this information. You can poll any election anywhere and see results like this. How many of you were frustrated by the fact that climate change did not come up once in any of the presidential debates in 2016? Yeah, this is why. How many of you were frustrated by the fact that it didn't come up once in the State of the Union this year? This is why. But you know what else? It also didn't come up in the Democratic response to the State of the Union. And this is why. It's not that Joe Kennedy doesn't care about climate change. It's that it's really hard to expect any leader, any leader, to talk about issues that voters don't care about. Politics is, I mean, despite the very disruptive and distorting influence of money, politics is still an efficient marketplace, just like any other marketplace. And who on earth is going to supply a product for which there is no demand? And right now, there is no demand in the marketplace for environmental leadership, none. Okay, back to the story of why we founded the Environmental Voter Project. This was something that frustrated the crap out of me in all of my campaigns. I was very lucky in that I, uh, I was not working for campaigns for money. I worked at the DNC, the Democratic National Committee, and then at uh, a law firm that allowed me to take leaves of absence to work on campaigns. So I could always work for great environmental candidates. But it would have been malpractice for me to tell these clients of mine, hey, let, let's talk about the issue that no, none of the voters care about. This always really frustrated me. Because campaigns only target likely voters. They only target likely voters. So these polls of likely voters are really, really important. Now I wanna stress something here that if if this is the only thing you take away from today, let it be this. Let it be understanding this at a very, very deep level because it is the lifeblood of all politics and policy making in the United States. Who you vote for is secret, but whether you vote or not is public information. Whether you vote or not is public information. And the first thing any campaign does is let's say I'm running a campaign for governor in Connecticut. I look at the publicly available voter file and I see, oh, you guys aren't even registered to vote. You guys are registered, but you never bother to show up for anything. You guys, you vote in presidential elections, but not much else. Ooh, you vote for president and governor, you vote like every two years, and you guys vote all the time. If I'm running a campaign this year for governor, do you think I talk to any of you? No way in hell. I probably don't even talk to you guys because you only vote in presidential elections. I only focus on you. I only focus on you. And that's so important to understand. And again, it, it might sound cynical, but we, we accept it. We accept it in every other aspect of our lives. I mean, we wouldn't expect Ford to try to market cars to three-year-olds. Three-year-olds don't drive. We wouldn't expect Starbucks to sell coffee to people who don't drink coffee. Why on earth would we expect politicians to care about non-voters? No, they care about voters. And so campaigns only target likely voters, which means, of course, I'm not gonna poll any of you to figure out what you care about. I'm only gonna poll you guys. And right now, everybody knows what I showed you in that last slide. It's the easiest thing in the world for politicians to poll people who are likely to vote in the election they care about. And everybody knows that information I just showed you. Everybody, people who care about the environment and people who don't care about the environment know that voters listed as a very low priority. So why on earth produce policy for which there is no demand in the marketplace? 
This is something that really frustrated me. And to be honest, I, I didn't really think that there was a solution. And I'll, I'll, I'll freely admit this to a bunch of entrepreneurs. I, I, I am a very reluctant entrepreneur. I am not the type of person who was always dying to start my own thing. I went into this kicking and screaming. But what happened was I got off of running a mayoral campaign in Boston and uh, was taking some time off before going back to my law firm because my wife and I were expecting our first child. And purely by chance, purely by chance, I stumbled across some data that totally blew my mind. I was working with a friend of mine who's a, a prominent political pollster, and I realized that just because very few voters prioritize climate change in the environment does not mean few Americans prioritize climate change in the environment. And I'll say that again because it's important. Just because too few voters prioritize climate change in the environment doesn't mean too few Americans prioritize climate change in the environment. Actually, there are tens of millions of Americans who care so deeply about these issues that they list it as one of their top two priorities. So why aren't they showing up in polls of likely voters? Because they're not voting. We realize that environmentalists are awful voters. And the more I dug into this, the more I brought it to the heads of all the big environmental nonprofits, I realized we might not have a persuasion problem in the environmental movement. We might just have a turnout problem. We might not need to change anybody's minds. We might just need to change their habits. And when I get into what we do at the Environmental Voter Project, I'll suggest to you that that is extraordinarily good news. Because probably at any time in modern history, but certainly now in this weird, like, post-fact society we live in, changing minds is really hard. Really hard and really expensive. But changing people's behavior, changing their habits, I won't claim it's easy, but it's a heck of a lot easier. A heck of a lot easier. So before we get into how we started, I just want to go over very quickly some of the data. We identified 15.78 million super environmentalists who didn't vote in the 2014 midterm elections. Only 83, people, 83 million people voted in those elections. I will very briefly, towards the end of this presentation, get into how we identify these people. But just to be very clear, I mean it in like the most disturbing Orwellian sense. Like we literally know who all these people are by name and street address. We have identified these super environmentalists and we know for a fact that they don't vote. Why? Because of the one thing I told you you're not allowed to forget, whether you vote or not is public information. It's public information. So we know these people aren't voting. What does this mean in context? We now have a pretty round number of registered voters in the United States. There are 200 million registered voters. In 2014, only 83 million people voted. Of those 83 million, only about 4 million were what we would call super environmentalists, people who list climate change or the environment as one of their top two priorities. Those four squares do not drive policy, guys. They do not drive policy. They just don't. 2016 presidential election was a little bit better news, but still pretty crappy news. We had about 136, 137 million people vote. Of them, about 10 million listed climate change and the environment as one of their top two priorities. So what does that mean? That means there's another 10 million super environmentalists who are already registered to vote. Already registered to vote. They're just not going out their doors on election day. And remember how I went over how this leads to pretty dramatic policy impacts. Because if you are running for office in a midterm election, you don't care what all 320 million Americans feel. You don't care about what all 270 American adults prioritize. 
You don't care about what all 200 million registered voters prioritize. You only care about the 80 to 85 million people who are likely to show up. So at the Environmental Voter Project, at its most basic, what we do is we don't try to turn any of these dark blue squares green. We don't try to persuade voters of anything. All we're trying to do is we identify those people up at the top, those already persuaded, dyed-in-the-wool environmentalists who just aren't voting, and we try to change their habits. We try to push them into the electorate. Now, the reason I thought it was important to start an organization like this is because nobody was doing it. And nobody was doing it for actually some good reasons. The first is, is this. If you are an environmental nonprofit involved in the political space, chances are you have built sort of one of a few theories of change. Maybe you concentrate on impact litigation to change environmental policy. Uh, maybe you lobby policymakers. Uh, maybe you endorse environmental leaders to try to get them elected. The issue is, when you do any of those things, it, it actually doesn't make sense to talk to people who are unlikely to vote. If I'm trying to elect you governor of Connecticut, my only goal, my only goal, is to get 50% plus one of the market share of people who show up to vote on a Tuesday in November. That's it. My goal is not the long-term health of the environmental movement. My goal is just to make sure you win. And so what that means is, what I can't do, what's your name, I'm sorry? Becky. Becky. What I can't do is I can't say, Becky, I'm sorry we lost yesterday, but I spent half of your money talking to people who I was pretty sure weren't going to vote. That's probably why you lost. And I, I apologize, you don't need to hire me next time. You can't do that. Similarly. If I am an endorsement organization who has recognized that Becky is an environmental champion and I've told all my donors you need to fund our work to get her elected, I also can't go back to all of you and say, well, you know, I spent most of your money talking to people who we knew from their public voting histories were not going to vote. You can't do that. If your theory of change is, hey, let's elect the right people and we'll get the right policy, you can't talk to non-voters. The problem is, as wonderful as Becky might be, if we do elect her, it's still going to be really hard for her to push and spend her political capital on something that voters don't care about. And so if no one is just trying to change the overall demand in the marketplace, if no one is trying to change the power that environmentalists have among voters, not among non-voters, well then we'll never be able to break out of this cycle and we'll never be able to get the leadership that we'd like. And so we realized not only was there a real need for this, but nobody was addressing it and no one probably could because they had, they had built their organizations around an alternate theory of change. That, by the way, is important. I'm not gonna claim that electing good environmental leaders is not important. It is extraordinarily important but it's nowhere near sufficient. Nowhere near sufficient. So, how did we start? Uh, we crowdfunded $400,000 uh, to launch in the fall of 2015. And all we wanted to do was have a year-long proof of concept to show that we could do essentially the first two of these three things, identify accurately identify super environmentalists who weren't voting, and then mobilize them to become better voters. The third thing, habit reinforcement, was more of a long-term thing that we weren't sure we could, we could show in the first year. That's all we wanted to do. The good news, though, is when you don't care about trying to persuade someone to vote for someone else, if all you're trying to do is measure those two things, you can actually do something that almost nobody else in politics can do, and that is bring real scientific rigor to all of your metrics. Right? If I'm trying to elect Hillary Clinton president and I spend $100 million on really sexy TV ads targeted to you guys, I still don't know who you vote for on election day. 
nor do I know if my ads had an impact on that decision. There's some uh, sort of indirect evidence that I could point to, but it is at best indirect. The great thing about what we were planning to do in our proof of concept was we could essentially prove both of our things with real scientific rigor, and this is how we did it. The first thing, how do we accurately identify environmentalists who aren't voting? Well, we build very sophisticated predictive models. We don't have lots of time to go into this because I'm only gonna talk for about six more minutes before we have our Q&A. But big data has revolutionized politics. I know you guys are sick of hearing about big data and machine learning and all this stuff, but uh, rest assured that uh, we live in a really invasive Orwellian political society now where campaigns know thousands, thousands of consumer and behavioral data points about most voters. They really do. And for all of you who felt really uncomfortable about what Cambridge Analytica was doing, you should. They're thieves, like, like they literally stole data. But when they took the data that they have to build these very sophisticated models that allowed them to individually identify people, they were doing something that was no different from what most sophisticated political campaigns do now. And it's really important to understand that. If all of you are registered voters, I can guarantee you that in the 2016 presidential election, both the Clinton campaign and the Trump campaign had assigned scores from zero to 100 to every single one of you as individuals. And it was appended to your individual records on the voter file. They had a score for you telling them how likely you were to support Hillary Clinton. They had a score for you telling them how likely you were to walk out your door on election day, a turnout score. If you were undecided, they had a score for you telling them how uh, possible it was that you might change your mind. And these were frighteningly accurate. Very, very quickly, what we do is, you don't need to read all this fine print, we poll 20 to 30,000 people per state off these data-rich voter files, asking them what issues they prioritize. And then it's pretty easy for data scientists to look for the hidden patterns and correlations. They can say, oh, look, people who are forestry employees have a really high likelihood of caring about climate change. Ooh, and if you only use a cell phone and gotten rid of your landline, that's also pretty high. Oh, and if you're a Catholic or a basketball fan, like all these weird data points. And then they can put together distributions and they can say, oh, so this is Florida, I think. This is every registered voter in Florida. They can say, oh, there's almost 450,000 will only have a 10% likelihood of prioritizing climate change. But there's a whole bunch of people who have over a 65% likelihood of prioritizing climate change. Now again, I realize I'm like flying through this really quickly, uh, and that's because this is not like a big data seminar, it's a founder's uh, practicum. But what we, what we realized from some of the work that I had done on campaigns was that we now had the ability to with real scientific rigor accurately identify who deeply cares about environmental issues and who doesn't. And what we did during our proof of concept was we built these, these predictive models and then we shipped them to outside polling companies. And we said, here's a list of people who we think care so deeply about climate change and the environment that they'll list it as one of their top two priorities. Can you check our work? Off the top of their heads, 89% of the respondents came back listing climate change and the environment as one of their top two priorities. So boom, we succeeded on that. The second thing that we wanted to do was we wanted to prove that we could isolate the ones of these who were poor voters and change their voting habits. Now the isolation part, you don't need to like be a data scientist to do. Why? because whether you vote or not is public information, right? We could just find these super environmentalists, put all the good voters over here and say, don't worry about it, the Sierra Club's gonna talk to them, we're gonna concentrate on the really crappy voters. And then what we did was, we ran what's called a randomized control trial. And I'm going to very quickly fly through this and forgive me for like all of the behavioral scientists in the room uh, for me like making this very, very simple. But what a randomized control trial is essentially, let's say we identify a million poorly voting environmentalists. What we do not do is immediately start talking to all of them. 
Instead, before we talk to a single one, we randomly remove 20% and put them in a control group. Now these people are non-voting environmentalists just like these folks. And through a randomized process, we remove them and set them aside. We don't talk to these people. We only talk to the remaining 80%. We called them, we texted them, we canvassed them, we sent them digital ads, we sent them direct mail. Then the election happened. We still don't know how we did. But two months later, voter files were updated and whether you vote or not is public information. We could see, oh, the people in our control group turned out at 21.0%. People in our treatment group turned out at you know 25.4%, which means we could prove with real scientific rigor that we were solely responsible for increasing turnout by 4.3% while controlling for all outside variables. Again, a really sort of scientifically rigorous data point. And for those of you who don't think 4.3% is a big deal in this business, talk to Hillary Clinton. <laughs> this is everything, everything in this business. Remember, we identified 10.1 million already registered super environmentalists who didn't vote in 2016, an election that was decided by 77,000 votes. So we were able after this first year to run multiple experiments in multiple elections, simply identifying these environmentalists, mobilizing them to vote. And we had these real metrics that we could take to potential funders to show, hey, this is what we're doing. And most importantly, I realize I'm close to running out of time, what we were really able to do, because remember, if my goal is just electing Beth, Becky, Becky, sorry. If my goal is electing Becky, I don't really care about incremental change over time. What I care about is getting you 50% plus one of the vote on one day. But the Environmental Voter Project, what we were saying is we want to address this, we're, we're sort of taking an electorate changing approach. We want to, over a longer term, address this underlying demand or lack of demand in the marketplace. So what we were able to show in that first year, because as I hope at least some of you know, you have many elections each year, not just presidential ones. During that first year, during our proof of concept, there were four different elections. We started in Massachusetts. There was a city council race in Boston. There were the Super Tuesday presidential primaries in March of 2016. There were some special state senate elections in April, and then the presidential general. And we were able to run a longitudinal experiment, a long-term experiment, where there was a certain part of our treatment groups that remained the same in all four of those elections. And what we realized after the fourth election was that the people in our treatment group were now voting at a 12.1% higher rate than the people in our control group. A really, really big delta. Now, for a whole bunch of reasons, this has to be a nonprofit uh, campaigns, as I've said a few times now, have very different goals. They are not necessarily worried about the long-term health of the environmental movement. They aren't necessarily caring about incremental change over time that leads to something big three or four years from now. They're worried about getting a majority of the market share on one Tuesday in November. And so this wasn't something that we could sell to one campaign. And to be honest, they could do a lot of the stuff that we're doing. There's nothing proprietary about this. Uh, but there was a real need for this in the nonprofit space. There was a real need for this in the environmental space because people recognized that no one was going to deliver this product we wanted. No one was going to make really aggressive, leading environmental and climate policy if there was no demand in the marketplace of voters, of voters. And so that's why we chose to, to make this as a nonprofit. And we, uh, we ended up realizing sooner than our first year was over uh, that we were just hitting a home run. And so we expanded into Georgia last spring. And then this fall, we expanded into Colorado, Florida, Nevada, and Pennsylvania. Uh, very, very quickly, 
just I want to, and, and I, then I need to finish. A really interesting counterintuitive thing that I wouldn't say we discovered because a lot of other behavioral scientists are zeroing in on this around now too. The Environmental Voter Project, wanna know what we never talk about? The environment. Because remember, we're pretty confident in the accuracy of these people we're identifying. And if I know that nine out of every 10 of the people I identify as environmentalists truly are super environmentalists, well, I could talk about chocolate chip cookies if it gets you to vote, right? Like all I care about is changing your behavior. And what we've realized is using social pressure and peer pressure, simply saying things like, hey, last time there was an election, do you know that 85% of your classmates voted? Simply using messages like that were the most powerful drivers to action. Um, so that's what we do. We're measuring our short-term effects, our long-term effects. We're having a pretty significant impact. And uh, finally, I know you wanted me to talk a little bit about scaling. We, uh, this past year, we targeted 150,000 of these poorly voting environmentalists. So this was in 2017. We're now scaling up to 2.4 million. Uh, because we've identified in these six states, Nevada, Colorado, Georgia, Florida, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, 3.05 million super environmentalists who are unlikely to vote. Now, why are we only targeting 2.4? Because we still run randomized control trials wherever, wherever we work. We still want to be able to prove to our donors, who are individuals, some public charities fund us, but we want to be able to prove our impact to them. And so our hope is to eventually scale up to about 22 states. We've, uh, our data shows that there are 22 states that have very large populations of non-voting environmentalists. And that's important to us, right? We need to have a big denominator or else we're not really gonna have a big impact. Uh, I could, we could go into Idaho and hit a home run every time there's an election, but there just aren't enough targets there for us to really have an impact on policy. Um, I will close with this, two things. One, uh, I realize that this is an academic environment, but just uh, from a pure civic engagement uh, perspective, please, please do not leave today thinking like, oh, this Stinnett guy told me that environmentalists aren't voting, like this is awful, we're all going to hell. That is not the right message to take away from this. This is good news. This is good news. If I told you we've done lots of polling and it turns out no one cares about the environment, that would be bad news. That would be bad news. But that's not what we found. We found something that was able to you know, bring a lot of hope to a pretty dark picture. We've realized that there are a lot of people who are already persuaded. We just need to change their minds. We just need to change their habits. And as I said, I will not claim that's easy, but it's a heck of a lot easier. Changing habits is easier than changing minds. And that's the point of leverage that we focus on at the Environmental Voter Project. It might not be as sexy as really big communications campaigns, but we're able to show these really proven metrics that our philanthropic investors really, really appreciate. They really, really appreciate it. The second thing I'll say, because I, I think this also applies to a lot of people uh, who are sort of in an entrepreneurial mindset, what we've come to realize over the long term is something that's really, really extraordinary. And that is we're seeing, as I mentioned, the, these sort of year-long trends in our longitudinal experiments, not because we think we're actually doing such an extraordinary job. It's because we're taking advantage of a built-in aspect of the marketplace. So by that, I mean this. I don't think we're magically flipping a switch in people's brains and turning them into super voters. What's happening is I get you to vote for the first time in a sleepy little city council race. Two months later, there's a neon sign next to your name in the public voter file. So when someone's running for governor or Senate, they say, oh, dear God, like if he's crazy enough to vote in a city council election, he's totally going to vote in our election. And so what we're seeing is the cavalry come in. We're seeing all of these well-funded campaigns start to turn out our voters at no cost to us. 
It's like amortized success almost. And we're graduating them out of our target populations. There are 4% of our targets in Massachusetts where we started over two years ago who we no longer even talk to because they now vote with such consistency. We're confident that the people we really care about, policymakers, target them all the time. So I went a little bit over, I apologize, but that's the Environmental Voter Project. That's why we started. That's the problem we're trying to solve. That's how we solve it. Uh, we've got a little bit more than 20 minutes for Q&A, and I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'd love to hear your questions. Um <laughs> I just want to remind everyone to please use your mics. Yes. Hi. Hi thank you so much for being here. Um, so the process that you've come across where you identify voters who care a lot about an issue but aren't voting and get them out to vote obviously could be replicated for voters who care a lot about any issue, whether that's expanding gun rights, bringing religion into schools, or anything else. Um, do you guys worry about making your process so public? Do you worry about it being replicated? Uh, so your, oh wow, I should have been standing here the whole time. Uh, your underlying premise is absolutely right. There's nothing proprietary about this and anybody could do it. But we don't worry about that. And here's the reason why. This is only an efficient, uh, point of leverage, this is only an efficient sort of theory of political change, if the issue constituency group that you care about is made up of disproportionately awful voters. So I'll give you an example. If I am, if I was running the NRA, not that I would ever do that, but if I was running the NRA, my people vote already. I mean, right now in the United States of America, if you deeply care about gun rights, you vote like it's your job. So if I was running the NRA, I'd spend my money making sure, I'd spend my money on persuasion. I'd spend my money making sure that the people who vote know the right person to vote for. Because again, this is, this is not some secret sort of election winning project. It's an electorate changing project. And so it only really has value if your constituency is underrepresented in the only marketplace that matters. But can it be replicated among issue constituency groups who share that problem? Totally, it totally can. Uh, and you know, I care about environmental issues, so I haven't done the research to, rec you know, to figure out what those are. My guess is you know, people who tend to care deeply about uh, student loan forgiveness or immigration rights or things like that probably don't vote as often as, as other people do if you just look at demographic indicators. Uh, but I am not necessarily worried uh, in particular about our opponents using this because as someone who lives with this voter data every day, I can tell you this, the environmental movement's opponents have a lot going for them they are bathing in money. They have Citizens United at their backs. <laughs> but what they do not have is a bunch of yet to be activated environment hating voters. Like, like there just isn't this dormant army of people who deny climate change and hate the environment waiting to get mobilized. And so this is this is an enormous opportunity for the environmental movement. Could a similar opportunity exist for other movements? Absolutely. But I think in order for it to be really impactful, they'd have to have a similar voting problem than we do. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, out of curiosity, what are the factors that make people less likely to vote? In other words, why are there so many environmentalists who do not vote? Great question. Uh, and I'm going to give you a very honest and very unsatisfying answer. Not only do we not know, we will probably never know. Here's why. Uh, as I showed here, it's pretty easy for behavioral scientists to set up an experiment that tells you how to get someone to take an action, right? Like I can test whether giving you a $5 coupon is enough to get you to buy something as opposed to a $10 coupon. What's really hard, at least with any scientific rigor, is to set up an experiment 
that tells you why someone is not taking an action. Why is someone not voting? Why is someone not exercising? The best you can do, really the only thing you can do, is just ask them. And what do you think happens when you ask people why they don't vote? They lie their pants off. They lie their pants off. Remember, and I'll say it for like a seventh time, whether you vote or not is public information. We, you ask like the crucial question, and we've asked it ourselves many, many times, and we ran lots of studies. Uh, and what we realized was a few really interesting things. So I'll, I'll just very briefly go over one sort of set of studies that we did. We identified a whole bunch of environmentalists. Half of them, I'll make you guys the really good voters this time, half of them never missed an election. The other half of them had been registered for at least five years and had never voted once, not once. We asked everybody the same set of questions about civic engagement, the importance of voting, things like that. And we learned some really amazing things. The first was this. Everybody answered all the questions the same. We asked the super voters, do you think it's important to vote in every election? They said, oh yeah. We asked the people who had never voted, do you think it's important to vote in every election? They said, oh yeah. We asked the people who had never voted, do you think that politicians care about the issues that you care about? Like, no, they don't care. Do you think politicians care about the issues you care about? No, they don't care. Do you think politicians are responsive to environmental concerns? No, they're not responsive. These guys said, no, they're not responsive. No matter what we tested, it was really hard to figure out what made these people different from these people. The only question, the only question that was unique in this survey was we asked the people who we knew for a fact from their public voter files had been registered for at least five years and never voted once. We asked them an open-ended question, which is kind of expensive in polling. We said, when you don't vote, what are your reasons for not voting? The overwhelming majority, I think it was 78, 79%, said something to the effect of, oh no, I always vote. Now remember, we know for a fact that these people have never voted once. <laughs> and we thought they might lie, so we actually had a backup question ready. We said, oh, okay, well, you know, on the, on the rare occasion that you don't vote, uh, what are your reasons for not voting? Because again, like you asked the crucial question. We were trying to figure out what is, what's the problem here? Why aren't these people voting? A smaller majority, because we made it easier by asking the question that way, uh, easier to, to be more truthful. A smaller majority, but still a majority. Still a majority, still over 50% said, no, you don't get it. I always vote. They lied their pants off. So the honest answer is it's a black box. We don't know why these people aren't voting. But these liars over here, they did give us some really important piece of information, didn't they? You guys still buy into the societal norm that voting is important still buy into it so much that you'd lie your pants off to a poor volunteer over the phone over and over and over again. You want to be thought of as good voters. And that, that doesn't tell us why these people aren't voting, but it does give us a clue into one of the most powerful ways to change their behavior. And that's to use peer pressure and use social pressure and take advantage of that societal norm that they still buy into. And that is why I just very briefly mentioned the Environmental Voter Project doesn't talk about the environment. We've tested it. Believe me, I would love to talk about the environment all the time. It's really important to me. It doesn't work. It doesn't get you guys to vote. Having a rational discussion about the value of, their, of your vote, like at some cost-benefit analysis, is a fool's errand. But instead, take it, taking advantage of the type of person you want to be and the personality you've built for yourself and the societal norms that you adhere to, that is a really powerful behavior change agent. It's something I'm gonna be going over a bit this afternoon in uh, the, the Psy City Behavior Change Workshop. But at, it, at, its, at its crux, that's what we do at the Environmental Voter Project to change behavior. And it's what a lot of people who are trying to change people's behavior focus on. They find societal norms that you try to adhere to and take advantage of that. Like, probably none of us want to be caught 
eating our lunch with our mouths open, right? Like that's a societal norm that we probably wanna, wanna adhere to. Uh, does that mean we like never eat with our mouths open? Like no, of course, like we deviate from that norm. But you can take advantage of that to change people's behavior. You can let people know how many of their neighbors do that. Another societal norm, unless you're a sociopath, you probably want to be known as an honest and trustworthy person, right? Does that mean none of us ever, ever lie? No, of course not. One of the most powerful tools we have and any political campaign has to get someone to vote is simply to go up to them, say, do you intend to vote? Oh, you do? Great, will you sign this pledge card saying that you're going to vote? And then they mail the card back to them. We do this at the Environmental Voter Project. The power in that reminder is not reminding you that there's an election coming up. It's us saying, don't you want to follow through on your promise? Don't you want to be an honest and trustworthy person? Look, I have it in your own handwriting that you promised to vote. Tuesday is your opportunity to follow through on that promise. And by the way, whether you vote or not is public information, and we'll follow up with you after the election. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Um, so I have two quick questions. The first is um, if there's any particularly strong or interesting signals that the uh, uh, model you guys built has kicked out in terms of identifying um, environmentalists. Um, and the second is that you've gotten really good at identifying the environmentalists, and then you apply these tried and true uh, voter mobilization techniques. Um, but the one thing we know about you know, the group of folks you're trying to reach is that they, they don't vote which suggests that maybe the tried and true have not been super effective in, in reaching. So I'm wondering if there's also any um, suggestions in the data about alternative approaches to, to mobilizing these guys that you found. Right, right, great questions. So to the first one, <clears throat> uh, who are these environmentalists? Uh, before, I, before I give you the real answer, first let me give you some caveats. Uh, behavioral and consumer data is always more predictive for us than demographic data is. So I'll give you some of the sort of big picture demographic answers to your question, but first let me go over some of the behavioral and consumer data. In pretty much every state where we have run these models, and by the way, this goes regardless of your age, like you could be 27 or 77, if you have ditched your landline and you only use a cell phone, that is a really powerful indicator that you are likely to care about climate change and other environmental issues. Now don't get caught up in like the causal relationship. There probably isn't one. Maybe there is, I don't know. We've just recognized this strong correlation over and over and over and over and over again. And we put it through the ringer and we test it and test it and test it and it always comes out. That's one really interesting data point. Uh, knowing what type of sports you really care about is really valuable in pretty much every state. Basketball fans are more likely to care about climate change and the environment than football, baseball, and hockey fans. That doesn't mean that like a majority of basketball fans care about this, but like weird little data points like that often help us. Um, who are these people from a demographic uh, perspective? They're not me. Like the old stereotypes no longer hold true. We are not talking about a uniformly young, white, uh, not that I'm wealthy, but wealthy group of people. I would go so far as to say that at least the type of environmentalists whom we're trying to identify, and obviously you can define this population however you want, but we go for people who list climate change in the environment as a number one or number two priority. I'd say they're more likely to be a Latina grandmother in Phoenix than some white hipster in Brooklyn. This is an increasingly African-American and Latina uh, population uh, living within five to 10 miles of urban cores, usually making under $50,000. Now obviously that is like gross generalizations, but when we look for like the humps in the population distributions, those are the people we're seeing. Those are the people we're seeing. To get to your second question, uh, what we are realizing is working best with this group is to take advantage of how they see themselves and how they want to express themselves. So sometimes that is overarching like society-wide societal norms, you know, take advantage of the fact that you want to do what your neighbors do. So we send people report cards telling them how good a voter they are compared to their neighbors. 
Um, for environmentalists, we've seen it's a little bit more powerful to talk about what people in your, uh, in your age group are doing rather than people in your geographic sort of community are doing. We've realized that environmentalists really don't, or less than the, the rest of the population, we don't identify with our neighborhood. So for instance, what a lot of campaigns do when they take advantage of this social pressure messaging is they say, uh, you know, 80% of people in New Haven are gonna be voting in this election. And that, that's a, a, a powerful appeal to peer pressure and social pressure, trying to localize it to something that applies to you and people you might know. Well, what we've realized is that doesn't work as well with environmentalists as appealing to your age cohort, things like that. But by and large, the behavior change messaging that we have found is the behavior change messaging that's working well for other organizations too. They're just not seeing the impact in part because we have the luxury of having a different goal. I mean, if I'm running the Hillary Clinton campaign, my only goal is not voter turnout. A lot of my goal is voter persuasion, right? But the Environmental Voter Project, I have the luxury of not caring whether you like what I'm saying to you or not. If I send you a copy of your personal voting history in the mail, you might get really pissed off at me, but I'm not on the ballot. I don't care, I just want you to vote. If I'm running a candidate campaign, I don't have that luxury. And so they can't use some of these tools because they not only need to boost turnout, they need to persuade you. Yes? To what extent do you think that the existing voter base is not prioritizing the environment, not because they necessarily don't care about it, but because maybe like with the group mindset again, that the media is basically, by not including it in the campaigns, making it seem like no one cares about this issue and that this isn't a big issue? And do you think that that's something that you guys could tap into if that's true? Right, so it's a great question. The honest answer is I don't know, but I imagine that that is part of the frustration. I imagine that that's a lot of the frustration. Uh, but one thing that we're finding has a lot of resonance among people who express that frustration is helping people understand the power of their vote in the context of the marketplace. So you might remember earlier on, I used sort of a marketplace analogy for electoral politics. People who supply the product, policymakers making policy, don't care about what non-voters think. They only care about what voters think. And they pull the you know what out of you guys. I mean, as all of us are sitting in the room here today, my guess is there are probably 100 polls in the field across the country. They're not polling all Americans. They're not polling all registered voters. They're not polling everybody who voted in the presidential election. They're focused on the November 6th midterms. They're only polling people who offer their public voter file. They're pretty confident will show up on November 6th. And so what we're finding is effective and impactful for people who voice that frustration that you just mentioned, is making them realize that the power of their vote extends far beyond the impact that one person can have on the outcome of an election, which, to be honest, as we all know, is, is pretty much non-existent, right? I mean, I know we're not supposed to talk about this, but you guys know that your one vote will never, ever determine the outcome of an election, right? Okay. You don't need to be a mathematician to do that, and I know I'm not supposed to say that. But I have a larger point, which is to tell you that actually your vote is more valuable than you think. Your vote is not valuable because of some transactional value. Your vote is not valuable because in the state of Connecticut or the state of Massachusetts, I actually think I'm going to change the outcome of a federal or even a local election. No way in hell. You can do the math on that. No, your vote is valuable because don't you want to be over here? Don't you want to be in the marketplace? I mean, guys, none of you drive policy. You don't. You don't drive policy at the federal level or the state level or the local level. If you don't vote, politicians don't care about you at all. And that is not cynical. It's how any marketplace works. As I said, like, why the hell would Ford care about what three-year-olds think of their cars? 
Well, why the hell would a politician care about what non-voters think? And so what we've realized is a very powerful motivator for people who express that frustration is don't vote because of the incremental value, the transactional value that your one vote might get. Vote because even if you write your dog's name in on the ballot, you need to be in the marketplace because that is what gets picked up in the market research. We don't call it market research in politics, but that's what it is. And polls drive policymaking, believe me. Election day, I mean, that's like the one day each year when no policy is made at all. No policy is made in the intervening weeks and months and years between elections. And what drives policymaking there is polls of likely voters. That's what drives it. And so, yeah, I, I mean, I think you're absolutely on to something that that is a frustration that leads, leads to a, a really harmful feedback cycle. But one powerful way that we've found people can break out of it is understanding that like, voting is not about the name that you write on the ballot. Is that important? Of course it's important. Of course it's important that we elect the right people. But you also just need to be in the discussion because simply by being a, a habitual voter, you become a first class citizen in this country. And those are the people who drive policy. And believe me, like Democrat or Republican, like politicians go where the votes are. And again, that's not cynical. Like it's literally just how elections work. Like you go where the votes are, you don't get elected. It's that simple. It's that simple. It wasn't that long ago when the true leaders on climate change in the US Senate were the Republicans. Politicians go where the votes are. And if we flood the field, if we flood the electorate with people who deeply care about these issues, it will drive policy. Just like if we drive 5,000 coffee drinkers to the door of Starbucks, they will make more coffee. They'll make more coffee. Do we have time for one more or is that it? Um, no, that's it, it's 1246, okay. We have time for one more. If people have to leave to go to class, if you can kind of quietly <clears throat> Okay, yes, last one. So you mentioned that you're a reluctant entrepreneur, um, but I think what's really recognizable is that you kind of lived and learned from the campaign system and recognized a problem there. Can you mm -hmm. go about your process of exploring that problem and how it led you to start a venture instead of any of the other various paths that you could have taken? Yeah, I, I mean, to be honest, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I've been talking about shame and social pressure as a like behavior change agent. I, I think my wife shamed me into doing it. To be honest, I, I, I mean, I I didn't make uh, you know an enormous amount of money, but I, I made a decent amount of money working at a law firm. Uh, we were not going to starve. My wife and I both cared very deeply about this problem. And, and our kid was going to be born. And I had recognized this problem and this solution. And I got to say, it was, it was almost like I was playing defense more than I was playing offense. It was like, you know, am I, am I 30 years from now going to be able to explain to my kids, like, oh, well, you know, like we, we just focused on something else. Uh, I, I mean, I don't want to make it seem like this was an easy decision. It isn't. It was really hard for me. And it's probably hard for people who aren't reluct reluctant entrepreneurs. I, I mean, it's, you build personalities for yourself. You know, when I graduated from Yale 20 years ago, I was an opera singer. I know it doesn't sound like it now because I have a frog in my throat, but uh, I was an opera singer. When you're an opera singer, like that's a really weird thing. Believe me, it becomes a distinct part of your personality. And everybody knew me as an opera singer, and I was everybody's opera singer friend. And believe me, like when you're at parties, people don't say, hey, come meet my lawyer friend. But like they totally say, come meet my opera singer friend. And changing what I was doing at that point to go into law and politics was really hard. It's really hard to change how I identified myself among my friend cohort. And it was also very hard to say, no, I. I'm going to get rid of my fancy law firm business card. I'm going to get rid of this success that I have and try something new, try something scary. Uh, and I, I wish I could say that it was a hard-headed sort of back of the envelope calculation that made me jump in. It wasn't. It was a totally personal thing where my wife and I like really anguished over it. And 
and decided that it was something that we sort of had to do. And for very good reason, because of the, the uh, academic context that we're in, we haven't been talking about sort of political and policy ramifications, but I, I'm not gonna hide from you guys like the, the type of person I am. I'm a very liberal, uh, progressive Democrat. And I, I gotta be honest with you, I, I'm so glad I'm doing this, not just because it works, not just because it's succeeding, but because of the, I mean, if I wasn't doing this, I'd be like locked in the closet each day crying. I mean, we live in some pretty dark times and I, I feel very blessed that I'm able to work on something that not only is successful, but I feel is truly having an impact. And obviously there are gonna be multiple bottom lines in whatever all of you choose to do. But don't deny, don't push away these personal factors. I mean, I, I can almost guarantee you that 70% of what all of you end up doing is gonna be the same. Like a job's a job's a job, I hate to break it to you. Like it just is, it just is. And so don't deny some of those outside external factors. Don't deny what your spouse or what your friends care about and what you've grown up caring about because at the end of the day, that might actually be more important to what like gets you out of the bed each morning to go to work than other stuff. I realized by the time I was the, uh, finishing up being a lawyer, I cared more about like the puzzles I was solving than my clients. And it was fine, I was really good at solving puzzles for them, but that's what got me out of bed and, and that will change, that will change. I'm gonna stick around guys, uh, so you can come up and ask questions, but I'm also mindful that people need to head out to class, so thank you. <laughs>